Right, yeah, okay. So uh, first up, uh, we have uh, Michel Bitbull uh, introducing on a variety of realism that fits with an anti-realist approach of quantum mechanics. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to take it away, Michel. Okay, thank you. So um, my title seems a little bit contradictory. It seems a, a, a sort of um, a, a oxymoron, as, as it is said in linguistics. And yet maybe um, you have uh, some people who have tried to develop this apparent contradiction. For instance, uh, Leonard Susskind in The Black Hole War says, uh, how could the ultimate theory of reality be about nothing more concrete than our own degree of surprise at the outcome of an experiment? So here again, you have the connection between reality on the one side and the conception of quantum mechanics that, um, that uh, expresses only a degree of surprise at the outcome of an experiment. The, this conception of quantum mechanics was, um, for instance, the Copenhagen interpretation in the mind of Leonard Suskin, but it could be also cubism, for instance. So maybe the feeling of contradiction we have when we read such title or such uh, quotation comes from a, a poor conception of what reality can be and on a poor conception of what anti-realism can be. So this is my aim to develop both concepts. First of all, varieties of realism. So on this point, I will go a little bit quickly because uh, Chris Timpson developed uh, some similar material uh, yesterday. But um, the first thing I want to, to do is to say that um, there is a form of minimal realism that no one could deny, not even Bishop Berkeley would deny it. Um, this minimal realism is that something real is presupposed by our thoughts, propositions, and theories. But this something real that is presupposed by our thoughts, propositions, and theories might even not be a thing at all. So that's the reason why I put a quotation mark, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an interrogation mark on thing. This, this, is not fabricated by our finite reason and discourse, human reason and discourse. And this may surprise and resist us. This is the minimal variety of realism. But beware, realisms add characterizations to this minimal form of realism. They say that reality is external rather than internal. They say that reality sometimes at least they say, Reality is material, not mental. Reality is what the formalism of our theories denote. It's not just the empirical material. It's more than that. Also, they say reality is independent of us. It's not indissociable of us. And um, metaphysical realism is exactly of this kind. Metaphysical realism, which is also called external realism, real realism, robust realism, says that, the, as uh, Putnam expressed, the, it says that we can think and talk about things as they are, independently of our minds, and that we can do this by virtue of a correspondence relation between the terms in, of our language and some sorts of mind independent entities. Uh, to contrast this external realism, um, Putnam invented internal realism. This is the view that although the world may be causally independent of the human mind, the world's structure, so there is something that is independent but which may not have the structure we think are the structures of the world. And the structures of what we think are the structures of the world are in fact the structures we impose somehow onto the world. Um, so the, the most uh, popular version of realism in the 20th century, especially due to analytic metaphysics and so on, were linguistic varieties of realism, in which we would say that nouns refer to entities. 
entities that exist independently of language, of thought, of anything. Adjectives denote properties, things that are proper to entities, namely that are intrinsically uh, belonging to entities. Categories, it is said, carve nature at its joints. It cuts nature into pieces that are the, the right pieces, the true pieces, the pieces of nature. And modalities such as possible, necessary, and so on denote a plurality, a plurality of world, as in David Lewis. So according to Michael Dummett's definition of realism in this linguistic uh, framework, uh, it, realism says that statements relate to some reality that exists independently of our knowledge of it in such a way that reality renders each statement in the class determinately true or false, determinately true or false, independently of what we do in order to know if they are true or false. Scientific realism is um, the view that we ought to believe in the unobservable entities posited by, by our most successful scientific theories. This is the definition of Putnam, but as you see, it's a little bit narrow. It says that entities are real, and we'll, we know that structural realism doesn't say that. Uh, so a broader definition is, put, is um, Van Frassen's. Science aims to give us, in its theories, a literally true story of what the world is like. And acceptance of the scientific theory involves the belief that it is true. Um, a, more, a more elaborate, more sophisticated uh, view of realism is one in which you don't have this one-one correspondence between the, the, the world as pictured in the theory and the world out there, but you don't know anything else than the theory itself. And then you want to understand what the theory should be like in order to be not, not true in the absolute sense, but at least adequate. This is the strategy that was called uh, anterizing by Fine, referring to Einstein. So features like causality, entities, and so on, not are not directly representing nature here, but they are to be evaluated as options about what is better to assume when constructing scientific theories in view of the possible resistance in the empirical domain. So you have a sort of internal version of realism, but here not internal to the, the to, to language but internal to scientific theories. Now, let me come to anti-realism and to why it is sometimes misunderstood. There are, of course, linguistic aspects of anti-realism. So it's, they come exactly in opposition to what I've said about realism. For instance, first of all, verbs are more important in anti-realism than in realism. In realism, I didn't even have to, to, to bother with verbs. But in anti-realism, it's crucial. Verbs indicate actions, obviously. Nouns denote what? They denote not entities existing out there, but they denote invariant nucleus of phenomena taken as targets by agents. So an agent extracts out of the, you know, the, 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 the sets of phenomena something that doesn't vary too much, and it takes that as a target. Adjectives pick out relational, namely secondary qualities. In anti-realism, all qualities are secondary. There are no primary qualities. Categories, as for them, are not carving nature at its joints, but they are just conceptual functions of synthesis of phenomena, namely uh, tools that we use in order to gather clusters of phenomena together and to, to uh, isolate them from one another. As for the modalities, such as possible, necessary, and so on, they express domains of future actions. So action is central here. 
Anti-realism, obviously, do not respect the principle of bivalence. A proposition is neither true or false in itself. It's neither true or false if there is no procedure to prove or disprove it. So you need a procedure to define the truth or falsity of a proposition. Moreover, and this is crucial and also indicated in the definition of anti-realism by Demet, is that there is no way to purify reality by subtract, sub subtracting the modes of our access to it. So, you know, a theory is bound to be non-representational here. Examples, there are numerous, empiricism as instrumentalism, constructivism, positivism, phenomenalism, intuitionism, especially in mathematics, all these categories were unified in one concept by Michael Dummett, but he, he used the name anti-realism, which certainly was a little bit misleading because you have the feeling that anti-realism is against reality, which would be just absurd. So now scientific anti-realism. Science aims to give us theories which are empirically adequate according to Van Frassen. And acceptance of the theory involves the, as belief only that it is empirically adequate. So there is no more representation, no more duality between what, what the theory says and what is out there. And, um, and uh, it's obvious that we should uh, drop this idea of a correspondence between a theory and reality completely outside the theory. Why? Because it's impossible to figure out what would be a theory with, with no shaping by our concepts and theories. So for instance, Kant says, there is no way to compare knowledge with reality, except if we know reality. But then what we compare with knowledge is another piece of knowledge. So this idea that the theory should be faithful representationally faithful to reality is a form of antinomy, in fact. It's very difficult to, to hold as a position. Um, so, but then what is, you know, what is uh, the conception that anti-realism can have of the adequacy of the theory? And how can the success of scientific theory not be a miracle? as you know, as the famous argument in favor of realism by Putnam says. So the success of science here is not and cannot be explained by the, its one-one correspondence to entities or structures of an external independent world. It should rather be explained by means of the biocognitive concept of adaptation to a biotope. Unlike the independent world, the biotope co-emerges with the activity of exploring it, okay? So there is no correspondence, but there is adaptation and adaptation accounts for, for the success of an activity guided by a certain theory. Uh, and of course you have anti-realism about many features that are usually taken as real by, by standard scientific realism. For instance, entity anti-realism. Without entity, says Quine, there is no entity. Without identity, there is no entity. So our question, if we are anti-realist, is do you have any possibility of re-identifying a phenomenon? And then could we call a certain chain of phenomena, an entity. For instance, something, something like a trajectory. If you don't have a generalized way to re-identify a phenomenon, then you should say, you should drop the entity. So you understand how it is relevant to quantum physics. Um, structural anti-realism also. Because structures, according to Kant, for instance, are proposed in advance by our understanding. But that doesn't mean they are arbitrary, of course. We, we don't just invent them. We, we advance them and then we test them. They can sometimes be found empirically inadequate. 
empirically non-adaptative, I would say, rather than empirically non-adequate or non-representative, and empirically non-adaptative. Well, as I told you, I would, um, I would accept the paradox. To me, anti-realism is sometimes more realist than realism. And it is the difference that Cora Diamond makes between the realistic spirit and metaphysical realism. So for instance, anti-realism grants priority to the most tangible and visible realities, the so-called observables of uh, Van Frassen, Te the technology of experimental devices, the symbolic derivation on the blackboard, the lived experience of theoreticians and observers, things that, that are very concrete, that are immediate, that we see here. Um, also, a, an anti-realist accepts that even the metathesis, that the world, the external, the so-called external reality can be represented, can be falsified, okay? That the world can be represented, can be falsified by experiments. Um, also, a naturalist recognizes very easily the clarifying power of non-representative rationalist interpretations of quantum mechanics, such as Copenhagen, cubism, um, um, pragmatism, and so on and so on. Um, Anti-realism is really definitely not an irrealism. Anti-realism is a withdrawal from the unwarranted determinations of reality added by realists. For instance, reality might neither be external nor eternal. Why do you separate between internal and external, between subject and object, between mind and matter, between all these things? It can be neither formal nor purely empirical. It can be indissociable of us rather than independent of us. Um, and in this case, no discourse about, no symbolism of reality is available or can be available. What you can have in this case, if, if truly reality is indissociable from us, then you have, a, a scientific theory can only be a user's manual, as Chris Fuchs says, um, a, a guide for, for its inhabitants or participants. So what is the, the kind of conception of reality that fits with this attitude? It was um, indicated here by the hand of Ram Harry on, on the board. You know, he shows the word glove that he chose for, for naming his conception of reality. Glove is just a formless, a shapeless, uh, reality that has no differentiation, neither in inner and outer, nor mental or, uh, or physical, nor, uh, nor objects and, and subject, nor uh, multiplicity of objects and structures and so on and so on. Nothing, no differentiation, just potentiality for differentiations. And then from out of that, you might, uh, out of what in German you would call Welt, world, you, you form what we, you call an Umwelt, namely an own world, a world that, that is uh, directly shaped by human or others' activities. This idea of a shapeless uh, you, uh, initial, I would say, uh, reality was cl quite close to what Neoplatonician authors such as Plotinus or Damasius conceived as the one or the ineffable. I, oh, I just quote these uh, Neoplatonician philosophers here because my professor of philosophy of physics, Bernard d'Espagna, um, was very fond of these conceptions of reality and he was uh, defending the, the the conception of reality by Plotinus, the one. Um, also, other philosophers, must, uh, much after, many years after uh, Plotinus, 
defended this conception, undifferentiated conception of reality, such as Arthur Schopenhauer, for instance, who, who wrote a beautiful book called The World as Will and Representation. He said, we are not facing the world, but we coincide with it, qua dynamical process and inner impulse. This inner impulse, he called it the will. And according to him, the inner impulse or the will is what Kant called the thing in itself. So the thing in itself is not a thing at all. It's something that cannot be completely defined, but has some features of, of what we ascribe usually to the mind, not only to, 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 to matter. So as for the representation, the representation of the world that seems to be out there, according to Schopenhauer, it is just a projection of the power of this dynamical process. So what we represent as external is in fact blossoming out of this unique process. Maurice Merleau-Ponty was a phenomenologist, so he paid a lot of attention to experience, to lived experience. And according to him, lived experience is where we should start from and where we should link back to in any inquiry, because it's our primary given. So, uh, so in his beautiful uh, book, Visible and Invisible, he insisted that we can accept the world only after having witnessed its arising from our experience of raw being. Namely, if someone claims there is a world out there, I can prove it. Okay, I, I, agree. I completely accept this idea, but the proof can only come from a certain conception and understanding of what is in our experience. Experience is what we have um, uh, is the basis of any belief, any conviction, any proof whatsoever. According to him, so the, you know, the primary given cannot be immediately divided into subject, object, mind, matter, and so on, so on. So according to Merleau-Ponty, you should not, uh, necessarily try to formulate an ontology of the world. Instead of an ontology of the world, he proposed to formulate what he called an endo-ontology. And this endo-ontology is a discipline of the participant in being rather than an image for the observer of beings. So when you are completely immersed in what you want to understand and to know, what do you do? You formulate what uh, Berleau-Ponty called an endo-ontology, not an ontology. And a beautiful sentence of his gives an illustration of what he means. He said, okay, vision, vision. According to standard pictures, vision is you know, um, um, a picture that we get when we collect information from the external world. So some photons from the external world impinge on our retinas, then it goes to the brain and so on. And we, we see the external world through this process. According to him, this is not the, the right way to think because this very picture of a division between um, uh, retinas and photons and external objects and so on has had to be constructed. So what we have is a unique reality, this reality that is just there, that is neither inner nor, nor outer. And then it splits, it splits and we, we have a, a seer and the seen. And then here comes the sentence by Merleau-Ponty. Vision is a tool which allows me to be absent to myself, you know, that, that allows me to, to split and to contemplate from within the fission of being. So I, 
you know, the being splits and it comes in two, uh, in two entities uh, face to face, namely the seer and the sea. So now that means that we have to understand the relation between us and nature from the standpoint of an inhabitant of nature, from the standpoint of one who is not separate from nature. We could say from inside the world, as Carlo proposed yesterday. Transcendental philosophy by Kant, Husserl, and Merleau-Ponty is of this kind. It's a, it's a philosophy of knowledge for an inhabitant of nature. So if you are an inhabitant of nature, you, you are born with an experience of something that you then call nature, what do you do? You try to work on this experience, you elaborate your experience. First, you, anticipate, you try to anticipate, to predict what will come after in your experience beyond the present phenomenon. And then you extract invariance from all the successful in anticipations. And you count that both the entities and the laws of nature. Now, there is a, a recent uh, brand of cognitive science called inactivism or inaction in the vocabulary of Francisco Varela, who invented it, that is very, um, you know, similar to what Kant and other philosophers say. According to uh, this view of cognitive science, a living being, namely an agent, enacts its own world, its umwelt, as I told before. Um, so out of what there is, there may, may be a shapeless something. What does an agent do to, do, to, to perform this, uh, this, uh, this remarkable um, realization? First, he, the, the agent proposes schemes of action, a scheme of action aimed at reaching something, at mastering a certain region of experience. And a scheme of action is an implicit anticipation. For instance, when I, uh, you know, I put my hand, that means that I am expecting to reach something and to grasp something. Then the agent follows stable lines of least resistance in action. And these, these stable lines of least resistance in action become its meaningful objects. And then the, the agent can name objects for other agents and they can um, elaborate collective strategies in order to manipulate this environment. But the environment is co-defined by the actions that are aimed at uh, reaching it. Probability can be understood this way. Know that usually probability is understood either as a tool that we use when we ignore the real um, going on in nature or because nature is intrinsically uh, indeterminate. But there is another way and uh, this other way was already clear to the first founders of, of uh, probability, for instance, Fracastor Cardano said that probability is a tool that you use when you have a situation in which you can only have secondary qualities. So in this case, you could say directly as um, some authors such as you, you Price have said that probability uh, expresses um, chance, well, tries to, to, to deal with chance, and chance is a secondary quality. Well, many founders of the, of the theory of probability and many interpreters of the theory of probability uh, understood that this is a kind of, under, of uh, conception of knowledge that they, they should have in order to make sense of probabilities. For instance, um, uh, Bruno Definiti. Bruno Definiti quoted 
a beautiful sentence by Tilger about what uh, knowledge is. According to this um, author, thought is not a mirror in which a reality external to us is faithfully reflected. It is simply a biological function, a mean for uh, orientation in life of enabling and facilitating action. So if you understand knowledge this way, then probability becomes crystal clear. Um, for instance, I would quote, uh, I, I would like to quote this beautiful sentence at the end by Jean Cavaillès. Is any physical law is nothing else than a gamble for action. This would be the definition of physical laws by uh, cubism. Then the scandal of probability ceases. Far from being an inadequate substitute for our power to know, probabilities must be seen as a paradigm and the foundation of all scientific activity. So here, if you accept this no conception of knowledge, probability is not a, 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 a tool that is unfortunately um, something to be used in cases in which we have incomplete knowledge. It's the best possible tool of the best possible knowledge. In quantum mechanics, things can be understood this way, of course. For instance, I could um, uh, illustrate that by one of the most extremely instrumentalist conception of quantum mechanics that are found in literature, the one of Asher Perez, um, that would be called that could be called the quantum mechanics from the standpoint of an inhabitant of the world to be explored. According to Perez, quantum phenomena do not occur in Hilbert space, they occur in a laboratory. So we have to take this into account that the concreteness of laboratory events, not the abstractness of um, theory. Uh, and he concluded, Quantum physics is incompatible with the proposition that measurements discover some unknown but pre-existing reality. So that means that we have to figure out a situation in which a theory explores a reality that is not pre-existent or that whose, at least, whose structure is not pre-existent. And, you know, he, uh, Perez went very far in this direction by proposing an operational meaning of system and state. He insisted that systems, physical systems are not something that exist out there independently of us. We shape them by, by our preparation uh, procedures. And he finished by saying, the approach, the approach he advocated is pragmatic and strictly instrumentalist. Does it mean that Asha Perez completely uh, discarded the idea of dealing with reality? I don't think so. And this is shown by, this is shown by a certain, um, by a certain, well, I, I have, Apparently, oh yes, um, by this proposition by Fuchs and Perez in, in a paper, in a common paper. If the world is such that we can never identify a reality independent of our experimental activity, then we can be, we, sh we should be prepared for that too, okay? So we have to figure out what, what, sh what the world should be in order to prevent us from representing us, representing it, sorry. So an interpretation of quantum mechanics is a, an answer to, that, to the que following question. What should the world be like in order to be represented as an object of quantum mechanics? And you know that we have very little success in answering this question. We tried. We have, we have possible answers, but not many answers are very um, universally accepted and very credible. Now, there is also a meta interpretation. What should the world be like in order to display such stubborn resistance to being represented 
as an object of thought. Let's try to represent the reason why the world cannot be represented. An attempt to do that was given by John Wheeler in this beautiful but very misleading picture of an observer that, that uh, so to speak, um, rises from the universe and tries to see the universe uh, in turn. Uh, this picture was taken over by, by um, Amanda Geffner, who worked with Chris Fuchs, and gave this, uh, this idea of uh, you know, an object and a subject that looks separate, but yet are a little bit connected by a, a piece of cognitive tissue that has the scale of the Planck constant. Now, uh, you know, some, some philosophers, some not only philosophers of physics, but also general philosophers, such as Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the one I spoke of uh, earlier, um, gave a wonderful interpretation of quantum mechanics in their own terms uh, in two, two books, Visible and Invisible, and in the lectures of, on nature that uh, Merleau-Ponty gave at the Collège de France in Paris. So he tried to interpret qu quantum mechanics in his own terms. Which terms? The terms I've, I, I've explained um, earlier, namely the terms of an endo-ontology, not an ontology. Okay, an endo-ontology, namely a discipline of what it is like to be a participant of being, rather than uh, a doctrine of what, what beings are. Okay. So the model of Merleau-Ponty was the body. He said, nature resists. It cannot be posited entirely before us. The body is a nature at work within us. So in the body, you, you cannot separate really subject and object. The body is at the same time an object for itself and it's a subject that is contemplating itself as an object. The, the, the body has two sides, the seen and the, the seeing, the perceived and the perceiving. This is a very special uh, you know, item in our experience. But for Merleau-Ponty, this item, this special item that we call our own body was the perfect uh, representative of what the world is, namely a double-faced entity that can be both knowing and known. So according to Merleau-Ponty, quantum mechanics was a perfect uh, illustration of this status of the world. And the, re the, the reason why it was so is that, as he said, it is in vain that some physicists frame in and frame in an objectivist ontology a physics that is no longer amenable to it. According to Merleau-Ponty, you cannot frame quantum mechanics in a purely objectivist uh, framework. That doesn't mean that there is no objectivity it just means that objectivity has changed its meaning. It's no longer separateness between object and subject, but it is, you know, the new definition of objectivity here is universality of predictive uh, judgments. Yet, quantum mechanics, he insisted, doesn't put all truths on the side of subjective which would maintain the idea of an inaccessible objectivity. It rather challenges the very principle of this definition, of this division, sorry, and brings the contact between the observer and the observed in its very definition of reality. The new definition of reality involves the contact between the observer and the observed. And the objective and subjective domain, according to him, are domains that are constructed out of a totalizing experience. An experience that is 
that is completely uh, intermingled. His inspiration, the inspiration of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Maurice Merleau-Ponty was not a physicist. He was not a philosopher of physics, but he drew in inspiration from a couple of French physicists and philosophers of uh, physics who are a little bit, um, uh, well, forgotten, but uh, unjustly forgotten. For instance, Jean-Louis de Touche insisted that a physics in which some pairs of simultaneous measurements are impossible, namely, it's the you know it's the famous um, um, non-commutation of uh, of, um, of quantum variables. A physics in which there is these commutation relations cannot be a physics of intrinsic properties. It is bound to be a physics of pure relations. The theory will only provide us with predictions for future measurements on the basis of the outcome of previ previous measurements. So, uh, and then the conclusion of this reflection about the status of the theory is, was given by Paulette de Touche-Février, who was quoted approvingly by Maurice Merleau-Ponty in his Lectures of Nature. He, uh, um, Paulette de Touche-Février said, we are dealing with a human physics, a physics of solidarity, yet physics cannot be interpreted in a purely idealistic way. It requires a form of realism that can be called participatory. participatory. This formula, participatory realism, was uh, formulated for the first time in this book by Paulette de Touche-Février, and interestingly, the same expression came much later in papers by Chris Fuchs when he spoke of um, cubism. So I conclude now with trying to elaborate a, a non-dualist middle way for the philosophy of physics. So non-duality for phenomena, for state vectors, for entities such as particles and for laws. So, there are usually two conceptions of phenomena. Either phenomena are purely subjective, they are just appearances, or phenomena are objective insofar that they express or they reveal properties of things out there. So what, what should we choose? Another, you know, a third possibility is that phenomena are neither purely subjective nor entirely objective, that they are relational, interactional, such as secondary quality. And if we don't want to picture first the first the two terms of the relation, such as object and subject, such as uh, systems and instruments and so on, then we could say in the same way as Maurice Merleau-Ponty that the phenomenon expresses an instantaneous self-splitting of what there is and um, that this gives rise to what, uh, for instance, Chris Fuchs calls a little big bang, the little big bang of the experimental event, for instance. Same way for state vectors. Usually people hesitate, they say, is the state vector epistemic? Namely, it expresses half knowledge and half ignorance, or is it ontic? Namely, does it describe things as, as they are? Does it describe the real state of real things that exist out there? A third possibility was expressed by Blake Stacy, who is one of the protagonists of cubism. The, the third possibility is that state vectors are neither epistemic nor ontic, but they are doxastic. Doxa means opinion. Opinion is expressed by an anticipation. You anticipate something because we believe you believe something. Anticipation about a phenomena that an agent can trigger by setting an appropriate experimental context. So state vector do, do not anticipate on, on events that occur out there independently of us, but they anticipate on events that we could trigger by an appropriate experimental action. 
What about entities? Do they exist intrinsically or do they, um, do they, don't they exist at all? For instance, Schrodinger was very, very harsh on this uh, topic. He said, particles in the naive sense of the old days do not exist. And many other people would say, yes, particles exist. The proof is that they are discovered. They are discovered in, uh, in, you know, in a bubble chamber or in a, in a white, white chamber and so on and so on. Um, a third possibility is that, in fact, they neither exist nor don't exist, but that as um, some authors, such as um, uh, Jean-Marc Lévy-Leblon or Bernard Espagnard said, they have the mode of existence of a rainbow, namely they exist in relation. They exist as levels of excitation of quantum field in a certain experimental context. <clears throat> also lows, what about lows? Are they just the lows of mental workings? as a purely idealist uh, philosopher would say, or are they lo the laws of nature? Maybe neither, maybe, or be, maybe both. Maybe they are just norms of anticipation. For instance, um, uh, uh, Chris Fuchs claims that, uh, you know, the, the bones rule are norms of anticipation. They are neither completely <clears throat> external nor completely uh, agents produced, but there are norms for the anticipation of agent in a, a situation in which the agent cannot say anything. It, it, the, the norms are constrained by resistance to deviation. This is very similar to Kant's conception of the synthetic a priori. The forms of understanding, according to Kant, are norms of thought. They are a priori because they are anticipated and produced by us, yet they are synthetic because they, they are constrained by the fact that these norms can or should order experience. And experience says us something. It cannot enable us to, 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 to put any norm. So here you have what I call a non-dualist middle way for the philosophy of physics. And I hope it can satisfy both realists and anti-realists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if everyone could uh, share an applause in the usual way. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so um, we'll move to some questions. Um, if you just put your name or whatever in the chat, I will have a look and then I'll start introducing people one by one. So first up, we have a question from, oops, it's going rather quickly, Chris Chimpson, um, if you want to go first. Thanks, and thank you, Michelle, for a, a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, two comments, really, which might help uh, others in the audience um, comparing the content of your talk and my talk yesterday, because as you said, there was quite a bit of overlap, um, but I neglected when I sent you my slides to tell you something important about what I said, <laughs> rather than what I put in the slides, and this may have confused others in the audience, um, which was that one of my main points um, when rejecting metaphysical realism was also to um, say that rejecting metaphysical realism was consistent with having a pretty uh, robust uh, realism about the external world and indeed with a full-blooded scientific realism and so for me the point of the Bernard Williams kind of position is that it shows that you can reject metaphysical realism while still maintaining uh, a very large parts of our actual ways of being realistic in science um, and so then the question becomes when we look at scientific realism and realism about specific scientific theories whether or not one wants to treat the entities postulated by those theories in the same kind of way as one treats things like tables and chairs, sticks and stones in the environment. Uh, so, so that's one comment. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. The, the other comment, which morphs into a question, is then uh, the, the glob idea or the idea of the formless underlying reality, maybe even the endo-ontology idea of Merleau-Ponty. 
These seem to me to be to include relics of metaphysical realist thinking. It seems that that idea of the glove, the idea of the formlessness, is precisely the idea of um, there's something beyond. It's just that here the, the thing beyond is said not to have very much structure. But um, that, that seems to me, I don't really think we have a concept of glob. I don't think we have a concept of the formless. Um, we have a, an empty concept rather than the concept of the emptiness or a meaningless concept. So I think that these views are failing to, to get their way out of metaphysical realist thinking adequately. And that's why I think starting with the ordinary concepts of our ordinary conceptual scheme in the way of Williams, in the way of Strawson, is a kind of healthier rejection of metaphysical realism than glub, formless, or endo-ontology talk. Uh, so I'd be interested in your views on that. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, okay, yes, you are right. I entirely accept what you say, for at least the first part, and namely that the, the glub concept, uh, the idea of a formless or, uh, or ineffable or one reality is extremely metaphysical. And uh, I should, as a very, usually a critic of metaphysics, I should have abstained from that. But for me, sometimes, you know, uh, an alternative metaphysics, even though it's, it can be criticized at least as much as the other one, can be a, a therapy of, against ordinary metaphysics. So I, I take that uh, glove or one or ineffable or, or shapeless reality concept as um, a tool to cure us for, for a standard metaphysics. But of course, uh, you know, I, I am not a metaphysician. I'm just like Merleau-Ponty, a, a phenomenologist. So, um, so, so the, the only point we know is experience. And, um, and maybe we have also the, the conceptual tools we, we have developed since then. We have, um, you know, the ordinary conception of reality that is uh, encoded in ordinary language. And we use that all the time in order to start precisely the critique of this conception. The critique of this ordinary conception uses the words of the ordinary conception. But th that's not a good reason to think that the starting point, namely, the, the ordinary conception of reality is an appropriate one. So we, we have to, to acknowledge that we start from, so to speak, the middle of things, namely the language um, and, um, and the, an ordinary conception of the world, and we, can, we should progress and to cure us and to be so free from it that we can accept um, non-conventional conceptions of quantum theory, such as, for instance, cubism and uh, and pragmatism and so on, that really don't that do not fit at all with the standard picture we have. So, the globe concept is a pill we have to uh, to to swallow for some time in order to uh, see in more positively the non-representational uh, conceptions of quantum mechanics. That's, that's my, my attempt here. Okay, good, that's helpful. I mean, I think I still, um, I, I'm unpersuaded that the kind of criticism of our ordinary conception of the world, uh, well, that there is a, an appropriate um, criticism of our ordinary conception of the world, which isn't itself merely, uh, science pursued realistically, which may still make space for, for cubism as a possibility. I, for one, am someone who doesn't need the pill of glub to see that there may be something uh, in non-representational accounts of quantum mechanics. So maybe, but I can see that um, it may be a useful pill for some people. Anyway, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. Thank you. Okay, next up we have a question from Alexi. Uh, if you want to speak up. Thanks. Th thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, you know, that I share many of these thoughts, but um, there is one point that I find particularly critical. I think we, we need to go further on that point. And this point is the problem of lifting oneself above separation. 
So here you presented a number of uh, categories where we separate between objective, subjective, and you want to argue that uh, it's possible to, to do this, to perform this operation of lifting oneself above that. Now, in Neoplatonist uh, metaphysics, this uh, operation when a soul, I'm going to use the language of Neoplatonists, the soul, a soul lifts itself um, uh, above uh, what they call emanation or separation here. So is an, is an operation which is unmediated. It's pure contemplation. It, it doesn't use numbers or language. None of these systems enter into it because numbers and language are all about multiplicity and separation. So they're tools for, for, for multiplying. So in Neoplatonist metaphysics, this operation of lifting oneself above separation is unmediated by a semiotic system. There is no semiotics there. No numbers, no uh, language, no nothing. It's purely unmediated. I'm wondering whether this can be transposed in the philosophy that you are proposing. Mm. Uh, because that seems to be a very spiritual operation with, without any um, semiotic content. And here, if, for example, we, we want to talk about this uh, lifting over, uh, over separation, shall we in that case talk about um, maybe information of that, that a subject has? So some semiotic system seems to be necessary here. What do you think about that? Very interesting question, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I, I could uh, develop on, on Neoplatonism. I love this philosophy, but, uh, but I, I, I have to stick to the last part of your question, namely how to have an equivalent in the, the reflection about quantum physics of this non-verbal way to escape the duality. Well, the first possibility, it's, the, it, it, it's usually not very popular, but the first possibility is just to stick to the old um, saying, namely, shut up and calculate. Then you escape uh, any, you know, any analysis of the world into subject, object, uh, things, and so on. You just uh, try to anticipate what will come next in terms of phenomena, just that. Second possibility is to accept, nevertheless, some elements of representation, but always seeing them as qua representations, not qua, um, qua um, you know, pictures of a real world out there. You just use them as guiding representations. This was the attitude promoted by Erwin Schrödinger. Schrödinger said, we have a representation but this representation is not a picture of the world out there. It's just a tool for our, our, our minds. So if you do that, you escape duality, but it's a high cost because that means that you don't ask too many questions about what the world is. And this, is, this can be a little bit frustrating for <clears throat> many minds. You know? So here is my answer about quantum physics. About Neoplatonism, it's interesting also because uh, yeah, it's a different thing. So, so it seems that you are saying that we can still let some uh, uh, semiotic system, so some formalism, stay with us when we're doing this operation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, if not, Thank if you. you don't have any semantic system, then we don't have even a guiding system for our experiments and the uh, interpretations of results so it, it would be completely hopeless but uh, but we we need some semantic systems but we don't need in that case to to uh, to take them too seriously as uh, picturing something okay thank you okay next up we have a question from uh, ipolic yes uh, thank you very much for the talk it was uh, really really interesting uh, my question is, so to paraphrase uh, Perez, uh, I think he wrote in some paper that quantum mechanics can describe anything, but not everything. And it perfectly fits with yeah. relational quantum mechanics. 
And uh, I felt that it was also fitting with maybe Cubism or Neo Copenhagen interpretation in general. But here it seems like the cut is always between the physicist and the external world or what you want to describe. And so I was wondering, so it's not clear anymore in my mind. So I was wondering, is there some kind of additional criterion to identify agency, maybe based on metaphysical uh, points? Or do you, do you also agree with this quote from Perez that uh, quantum mechanics can describe anything but not everything? I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, first, this quote by Perez says, uses the word to describe. So interestingly, this comes from a paper by Perez that is much earlier than his full, uh, fully developed instrumentalist view of quantum mechanics, because according to his instrumentalist view of quantum mechanics, the state vector doesn't describe anything. It's, it just predicts something. So, but at any rate, um, th this idea of not uh, encompassing everything in the quantum theoretization uh, is very important because, um, because uh, we cannot take everything as an object. Um, Merleau-Ponty insisted on that. If you try to, to picture everything as an object, then you become yourself an object for yourself. And if you become an object to yourself, you uh, uh, without really saying that, in fact, there is something that is seeing this object that you have become for yourself. And therefore, you have not really encompassed everything of yourself. So, for instance, you know, I, I, maybe I could uh, try to go back to this um, um, sentence by, by uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And I didn't read it, but I think it could be useful at this point. You know, he insisted that our own body resists objectification. And since our own body resists objectification, therefore the world resists universal objectification. You cannot take everything as an object. Now, there is an attempt, nevertheless, by classical science to do that, namely to try to, to, to transform everything into an object, including the own body, including the subject. But then, you know, science, he said, wishes to introduce, reintroduce subjectivity as a special case of the relationships and objects that define the world according to it. This is extreme reductionism, I would say. And he said, then the world closes on itself. It's now the world has become a, a big, a huge object that includes you that, and you consider yourself as an object for yourself, okay? But he added, except that by what in us thinks and constructs science, we become parts of the big object. So, okay, you have become yourself object for, for yourself, but there is the one who is now taking you as an object who is excluded from this object. Okay? Okay, so makes sense. You can do whatever you want, but there is, there is, um, well, your very attempt to take everything as an object, including yourself, excludes the one who is now taking yourself as an object. So this is um, a difficulty that was wonderfully uh, adapted by Perez to the case of quantum physics. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up we have uh, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this inspiring talk. And can you go back to your last slide? So there you had these three categories, objective, subjective, and relational. So when I 
reflect on our practice of science, it seems to me that many things cannot be classified into either of these categories. And let me give you two examples, and I'm curious to hear what you would answer then. The first one is our exploration of the cosmic microwave background radiation. We measure photons that were created in the far past when we did not yet exist. And we conclude there have been objectively quantum events of recombination that emitted these photons. So there's nothing relational in this. And my second example is completely different. It's classical Newtonian mechanics. So some people say it has been proven wrong by relativity and by quantum physics, but it's as good as it has always been for our practice of science and for exploring many, many things. So I think many of us would still say it's a very useful, approximately um, correct science and the laws of Newton are still laws. We teach them as laws. And I would rather say all of our laws, even quantum laws, are just approximations, idealizations that have a limited range of applicability. So it's neither subjective, nor fully objective, nor relational. So what is your view on these two things, cosmic microwave, background radiation, and classical mechanics? Thank you very much. So first example, background uh, cosmological radiation. Um, and the, the radiation, you said, was uh, emitted when there were no, no human beings to, to capture it. OK, this is uh, apparently a case in which you say, OK, but I'm, I'm speaking of something absolute that existed out there before I, I existed, before human uh, beings existed. Yet, even this idea that something existed 30, 14 million, uh, billion, billion years ago, uh, something was emitted at that time and so on, is something that was, I would say, reconstituted and understood now by present human beings. We, sh we should never uh, forget that. And um, does he, apparently it's a little bit strange to remind us that, that even the background relation, radiation that was emitted 13 billion years ago is a concept that has been elaborated now in this very uh, moment of history by, by a, a society of human beings in laboratories. It sounds a little bit artificial to say that, but it's not artificial. Why? Because, you know, even this view is refutable in terms of Popper's uh, theory of science. Namely, you, you could imagine the next future in which you could say, oh, in fact, background radiation is, what, is not exactly what you, we thought it was. And it's another, uh, interpretation we should give to that, okay? It's not impossible. This not being impossible shows that we should treat background radi radiation, its location in time, the fact that it was emitted uh, at a time in which there were no living beings and so on, as a certain theory, not more. And so um, I think in this sense, it's still uh, relational. The, the case of Newtonian physics is also interesting because it looks like, you know, we, it's usually said that Newtonian physics is ontologically interpretable. And that unlike quantum physics that, that uh, puts so many obstacles to this ontological interpretability, even though even you know, even though even quantum mechanics is not completely averse to being ontologically interpreted, it's just difficult to do so, or it's controversial to do so. That is not impossible. But Newton physics is easy to interpret ontologically. Yet, you know, um, the very success of quantum physics was, according to Kant, Immanuel Kant, who came after Newton, very difficult to understand in terms of just representation of something completely independent of us. And that's the reason why Kant 
tried to interpret Newtonian physics as a relational theory. Not only does it express, uh, you know, um, relations between things, but also these things are themselves relations between what there is that he called the thing in itself and us. So even Newtonian physics is, well, you, you, could, you could discuss on that, but, but there is at least one interpretation that claimed that is much more easy to, to understand the success of, of Newtonian physics in terms of a relational conception of knowledge rather than in terms of an, an absolutistic or in an ontological construal of physical knowledge. So the only point is Sorry that- Sorry to interrupt just briefly. Um, so it's 10 minutes to my next talk. So I'll continue to introduce people for questions, but if anyone wants to have a quick break, now is the time. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, there are four more questions, in fact. Uh, so you might want to be fairly brief. Um, but yeah, sorry to interrupt there. Just that uh, seemed like a moment to do so. So can I, can I ask a question now? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Michelle, are you done uh, with the previous question? Or is there anything you want to do someone? Uh, Michelle? Yes. Uh, were you done? Uh, were you close to dealing with the previous question? Or no, I, I can. What? You can continue, but also there's Jean next. So I, I don't know if you want to summarize what you were just saying. Oh, that's OK, Dave. Oh, OK, OK. Um, in that case, uh, Jean, you are next. Sorry? Uh, Jean, if you want to ask your next question. Ah, ah, Jean, it's me, Jean. OK, hello. Well, I guess we know each other enough to know that we have to agree to disagree. But you see, when I see you, I have a theory of why I see you. The perception is seeing you. And the theory is that you're actually there and that Zoom works, that's advertised, and my eyes, I have a good eyesight, etc. That's the theory. Now, am I supposed to not to believe in that theory because I cannot compare it with reality, which is namely you, because it's a theory about why I see you, and uh, should I not believe in it because it's just, uh, according to Kant, I can't compare it with what is really there because anything I will say about reality is also a theory about reality. That's one question. Another quick question is, when I speak, when paleontology speaks of dinosaurs, it seems to me that they speak of animals for which the evidence is only bones. They have no way to observe dinosaurs and they reconstruct theoretically. I don't know how they do it, but they, they seem to know what they're talking about. Uh, uh, pictures of dinosaurs as if they were really there uh, millions of years ago before they were any, any human. And I can't see in what sense it's relational, except in the trivial sense that we know about them only because we know about them. That's a tautology. Then I can also ask, what about the temperature inside the sun? Again, I don't know how physicists figure it out, but they seem to figure it out. And certainly that's not observable. You don't want to go there and check. So it seems to me that there are quantities of unobservable, quant observable, unobservable objects in physics without speaking about quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, where people actually think they have theories that are trustworthy and then they tell us about how the world really is, irrespective of any relation to us, except in the trivial sense that when we speak about it, we speak about it because we must know about it, that's all. Thank you, thank you, Jean. Um, yeah, of course, there are many inobservable entities that are useful to physics. Uh, and no, no, not useful. Why are they useful? Why is it useful to know the temperature of the sun? Why is it useful? It's pure theoretical oh, knowledge. Uh, not Luke, useful uh, at all. Look, Jean, uh, if, if uh, the inner temperature of the sun was unconnected to any possible phenomenon that we can reach, ah, then it would be interesting for no one. That's the triviality part that you have to in order to speak about it, you have to know about it. That's the trivial part, which I concede, but, no, it's but, but it's not part. useful. It's not, we don't study that because it's useful. It's not useful. No, it's- it, There are millions it, of things that are dangerous. We, we would not study it. The, we would not even claim something about the inner temperature of the sun if this inner temperature of the sun had absolutely no consequence whatsoever on anything we can observe. Of course, of course. And, of of course, course, and in this course. case, it has. Nobody, has nobody denies that. You know that. It, no realist denies that. 
Okay. And not only it has consequences on what we can observe of the sun, but we can also, uh, you know, we can also make models in, in laboratories of uh, little uh, fusion reactors and things like that and oh. probe into it. So sure. it has connections. And it, sure, and, sure. But it has no, it's not useful to guide us in the world and blah, blah, blah. I and mean, it's just theoretical knowledge of how the world is. And I think we speak of the world as if it exists outside of us, that's all. Of we course, to know it, and to it know it, we have to study. That's that. the trivial part of what you say, which is true. The non-trivial part is in insistence on relation, except in, I mean, you know, because I see you, of course, I, as I said, I have this theory that you are there and that's why I see you. And of course, I assume that Zoom works as advertised, et cetera, et cetera. I have to assume all kinds of things. That's true. But eventually, what explains the fact that I see you is that you are there objectively. I don't think you are going to deny that you are there objectively, and that's the source of my seeing you. Yeah. Well, this anyway, is we have to agree. We, we have to agree. There's a big disagreement here, which goes on. I don't know the to what it is to be there objectively, but uh, I would say for, for myself and for yourself, by the way, but for myself, I'm here subjectively. Maybe I experience something, and this experience is the basis for anything I can say about anything else. Okay, so this is this is fine, but um, but for you, it's indeed the conclusion. It's indeed the conclusion that you have to do from your experience, from what you know about the workings of Zoom, of computers, and so on. Yeah. That there is someone here that. Who is, uh, who is uh, uh, greeting you and yeah. thanking you. Uh, but, uh, and then there is a procedure of connection between us because we need that also. We, we need, you know, all the, the things that were said uh, the other day about, the, for instance, by Carlo, Carlo Rovelli, uh, about how we agree with each other on a certain fact. And this is, objective in the sense of intersubjectively acceptance. And this is the basis for science. Um, and and I, I, I would say, Jean, you cannot deny that any conviction you have about the existence of anything is not based on your experience. Yeah, but what do you mean by experience? My experience is when I read books of physics, I read I mean, that's what I call my experience, but it has nothing to do with the experience of the world. I studied, I told you that before, we study physics, we don't go actually in laboratories and it has nothing to do with, I mean, I don't have a subjective experience of quantum mechanics or anything like that. I just studied it theoretically just the way you did. Yeah, well, so of course that's experience. I, I, I sit in a classroom, but that's not, you know, it's again, you assume a lot of theoretical baggage in order to connect what you learn in the classroom. You have to trust the experimentalists, you have to trust most of science, etc., to know that this tells you something about the world. But anyway, I mean, I think reformulating these things in relational terms is either trivial or false. I mean, there is a trivial part, which is that I know about the world only because I know about the world. And the other part is that when I speak about the world, I don't speak as of a world existing outside of me. I do. Yeah, well, at any rate, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, having a certain understanding of what is written on the textbook, seeing um, the result of an experiment in the laboratory and so on, are experiences. And, uh, and they are really the, the basis mm -hmm. for all, all what we do. So all the, you know, all the, the philosophers of science have to cope with this very difficult point is how do we connect the world with our experience? So that's a, that's a very- When I see you, I don't even ask myself, I just see you. Okay. I don't ask, I mean, that's a, it's just there are so many direct impressions that simply correspond to things out there that I don't even ask. Now, of course you can ask about electrons and so on, that's more subtle, but there are also the trivial part, which is, our ordinary experience of life where we see things out there in the world as it is. Anyway, if we don't have time, let's leave it because- you know. Yeah, 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 of course, this is a, a, a different standpoint, but I, yes, in fact, you know, if we, we see very, uh, if we see more um, uh, precise, precisely all these issues, we see that in fact, 
our standpoints are not incompatible because I claim that you know your convictions are perfectly uh, uh, you know respectable and important, but they are convictions. They are convictions based on a certain understanding, on a certain <laughs> experience, on 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 all your you know the the body of knowledge you have and. The, this is very respectable in, in this sense. So I accept that. Sorry to, uh, to bring this to an end, but I think it's time to move to the next, uh, next talk. Uh, sorry to... Uh,